I'm very sorry. I'm I'm having issues with um, with power here, and maybe this is a very good il illustration of the situation I'm going to talk to you about here, because I'm going to talk to you about an existential uh, experience um, about managing a local language archive. Uh, so I'm a university professor, but in addition, I also happen to manage a local language archive at a, a regional uh, cultural institution, which is known as Sedotola. Okay. Oh, so, uh, I want to move. Okay, next slide. So I want to start with a fact that everyone can check right now. So until at the time when I was submitting this, uh, my abstract to the symposium, I didn't want to sound that dramatic, but actually the situation ended being very dramatic because then if you had clicked on this link, you, you would have been directed to uh, the archive. But now if you try, and I invite you to try, uh, it has gone dark. So the archive is no longer accessible. And what I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to talk to you is a story, um, a narrative about how this project came into being and how we struggled to keep it going. And now how it has turned to be a real existential question. So this raises a number of uh, uh, issues uh, re regarding the place of DH in the global South in general, perhaps in Africa, but more specifically in the country where I live, that is Cameroon. And let me start now with the story there was once upon a time, an archive, which was visible and which was called, I hope it is still existing, or the, though you cannot access it. So the Archive of Languages and Oral Resources of Africa. So this was a project that was granted to Sedo Tola, so you see the, uh, the institute, host institution, within a framework of a UE funded a project and I was lucky to be the lead person behind lobbying to attract this grant and eventually we we, we succeeded in getting the grant into Sedotola. So the archive, the technological uh, package of the archive was set up by the Max Planck or at the Max, Max Planck Institute of uh, Psycholinguistics uh, at Nijmegen in Nijmer in the Netherlands and uh, uh, the the technology that uh, is used in our archive is used to be the same as the language archive of, uh, of uh, MPI. So uh, one of these technologies uh, included, of course, an upload and management interface, a browser interface, and several viewer interface that enable for streamlining uh, media, multimedia with uh, transcription, and also a search interface. So I'm going to show you briefly a number of slides to illustrate this, uh, what used to be uh, seven years ago, a cutting edge uh, infrastructure for, um, for let's say, um, well, low resource um, um, uh, institution. So uh, this is uh, an interface that shows uh, various options, including metadata display, metadata search, content search, manage access, etc. And we have on the left pane, you can see uh, a collection, or maybe I can I can get um, a backward, and you can see that we uh, were we hosted collections from several parts of Africa, including Central, Eastern, Northern, Southern, and West Africa. So uh, this was because we, the interface was really built to accommodate a variety of resources, including manuscripts like these ones, which were produced within, within um, a regional project to draft atlases of uh, Africa, of uh, let's say Central African languages. And we also had a very rich collection of uh, endangered uh, language resources. This is, for example, I just, I'm just showing you a screenshot because for reasons uh, of um, connectivity, I can't display the video. So you're having here a screenshot of a video showing uh, a hunter gatra community, which, which is specialized, of course, in hunting and, 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 and gathering. And uh, so we're able to go 
there. Uh, uh, most of the time with um, collaboration with um, contribution of our uh, students, which we usually send out for, you know, uh, school work to go and document uh, um, uh, these practices. But here and now we would also submit a grant to some of the funding institutions like ELGP and we were able to collect these resources. And if you uh, click on this link, you will be able to view uh, one of these videos, which is very, very um, uh, interesting video from my understanding. So we also had collections of photos showing uh, different aspects of the life, of the cultural, of the art, uh, life of the people around Africa, as I've shown you, including West and other parts of Africa. So the archive also included a collection of uh, heritage musical recordings, which were recorded within the framework of another uh, regional project called Ethnomusicology d'Afrique Centrale. So these tapes were kept to, to perish until this archive came. We were then able to um, digitize them into, uh, into formats that could be accommodated in, in the archive. And uh, also the archive was really, apart from being just a help for language uh, resources preservation, we, uh, it was also a full-fledged research infrastructure where linguists and anthropologists, researchers as a whole could perform a number of uh, research tasks, including concordancing, and I'll move straight to, to that um, option. Uh, yeah, a, a, an interface that, Enable and yesterday we, we we saw different projects uh, which use concordancing as um, as um, a method of um, searching for patterns. So this archive was equipped or is still equipped with these uh, technologies. We also had uh, an access management interface, of course, for reasons which are familiar to many of us. We have to make sure that resources which are available and especially the depositor ensures that resources are, are secured and are provided access or have a controlled access. So uh, the uh, archive was also equipped with this environment and getting these resources into archive was a very painstaking uh, undertaking. As I told you, this necessitated several investments, several field trips and um, involvement of many stakeholders and also a team of volunteers, most of them are students, and volunteers from communities who came from the village to meet us to help in uh, enriching the collections, etc., etc. I, I don't want to deal very much about uh, that administrative part of it. I'm talking about volunteers, maybe that can give you the taste of how concern has been the host institution. Actually, very little support has been provided to this project. That's what I want to, uh, to, to say. So all that is now gone dark. And this is the very sad part of this story. And this is where you start asking questions like, you know, do, do I really need to engage with this kind of project? What to do? To be or not to be? Okay. Now, what, what can explain this situation? How is it that an infrastructure such as this one, which was equipped with these cutting edge technologies, was not taken over by the local researchers, by local research institutions. Well, there could be many reasons for that. And there could be, as is usually customary in parts in this part of the world, this could be blamed on the lack of financial resources, especially as other archives which were running on the same technologies have migrated on other technologies. I don't want to mention these technologies uh, because I don't want to advertise on them. Some of them are commercial. So these archives have, have, have the means, of course, to afford this. Uh, uh, the language archive, I got an uh, email from them mentioning that they would migrate to uh, another, uh, to different uh, technologies. So we were left to uh, find solutions, of course. We were granted the archive and the uh, honors has been on us to keep it working. And this could also be blamed on maybe management vision and this scale of priority from uh, the management. And this is um, 
something that I have to say about, it. in spite of the growing difficult financial situation of the host institution over the past five years or so, the fate of Alora, which is the name, the short naming of that archive, would have been different if the scale of priorities in the management, in the top management, would have integrated the paradigmatic shift in knowledge production, preservation, dissemination, and valorization. So to me, this is this can not only be explained by lack of means. This is this has this can be explained by the relationship of uh, scholars of uh, universities and research institutions of decision makers in this institution with knowledge and this has just reminded me of um, a section of an article which i'm about to publish where i and i quote myself my critique of the model of linguistics and i was, I was addressing uh, linguistics specifically my critique of the model of linguistics that is dominant in uh, oh, um, I, because of our, your videos, I cannot read uh, what. So in parts of Africa and the insufficient knowledge production yield there too is entangled in colonialism. Put simply, I'm the opinion that the institutionalized model of scholarship that shapes uh, the pursuit of knowledge in the field of linguistics in Africa was not instrumented for the sake of knowledge production to the benefit of the society. So this to me explains the relationship to, uh, of scholars, of uh, knowledge institutions to the production of knowledge. Do we want to produce knowledge to the benefit or do we want to produce knowledge just uh, to perpetrate a social, social political paradigm or power relationship? If I'm a professor, I'm, am I really uh, committed to giving um, uh, relevant solutions to my society, or is it just a means of me of just promoting myself? Or, so these are the type of questions that I kept uh, asking myself. We could also blame it on lack of institutional collaboration. I think this is a very, very critical because digital archives belong in a digital society and being part of digital society entails collaboration. And many people have mentioned this uh, before me, sharing, reuse, aggregating uh, objects of knowledge and scaling them. And this is by no means anything individual institution can achieve sustainably, let alone lesser endowed cultural institutions just such as uh, those we have in this part of the world. So what do we do? Do we let things down or do we go forward? I think we should find a way forward. And one of the ways forward to me is inclusiveness. And I really enjoyed uh, Miguel Escobar's uh, talk yesterday, who was mentioning the emic approach to designing inter. There is no neutral inter. So I think one of the limitations of this archive was that it was set up in a context where there is a monolingual mindset. The interface was set, uh, was in English, in a situation where most users are French speakers, and most of them are not speakers of uh, either language of uh, wide com wider communication. So this also has to be addressed in our representation of how uh, in, uh, in the design of interface. There is also, to me, an elitist uh, perspective to scholarship when it come to, comes to interface design. Research, and for that matter, language archive, usually are designed for researchers. You have to be committed to finding knowledge to really be able to find your What about the other uh, population? What about democrat uh, democratizing knowledge and uh, getting you know, many people to have access to information? And another uh, way forward to me is engagement. And this is something that I will repeat. So engagement with scholarship been producing meaningful scholarship, linking knowledge and well-being. Knowledge not for itself, knowledge for the sake of enhancing human progress, well-being, linking knowledge to participatory public and community government. So to me, these are uh, places of engagement which can really commit us to embracing digital humanities, not just as, well, something fashionable, but really as a step, as a move, as a new move, and as in, uh, innovative move. 
So another point, and I'm going to end with that, is collaboration. Maybe as the director of this archive, this, has, this is something that I have not really considered from the onset. So, and I, I want to share, and I will end with a very positive note, that, and this email, I shared it yesterday with a colleague in South Africa, whom I had met uh, a few months ago in July, and many of the colleagues in this symposium were there in Leiden and Utrecht. Who, uh, Juan Stein, I'll show you uh, his, uh, his picture. I didn't ask for his permission, but I'm sorry. I, I'm hopeful that he's not, he's going, he's not going to contain that. So I, with him, I, I talked about the possibility of having our resources um, back up as at their um, um, uh, uh, language center, which is Sadila, uh, based in South Africa. So I just want to read this, um, you know, WhatsApp uh, chat that I had with him yesterday. Um, okay, so re uh, read with me in the red. I'm writing to inquire whether, yes, two minutes is fine. I'm writing to inquire, inquire whether you have had a chance to look into a lot of things we last uh, had our meeting. And uh, he answered, we were able to download the whole archive. So in terms of the data, that is safe. I'll send an email confirming that. So to me, that was a burst of hope and of really optimism that all the efforts, that all the pain that was put into building up this archive, in spite of the lack of vision, the lack of commitment from our host institution, these efforts are now able to thrive. They are now able, the archive will probably survive thanks to collaboration. So with that, I want to thank uh, Clarin because actually Sajila is sort of a Clarin center and uh, I've given a um, uh, lightning, uh, lightning talk uh, earlier this afternoon uh, um, about uh, a tool which is supported by, by Clarin. So I'm really indebted to Clarin for enabling collaboration between uh, researchers from around the world, especially from Europe and Africa. And of course, I'm thankful to Sajila and to Grant Stein, whose uh, picture you can, you can see uh, to, to the right. And of course, lastly, but not least, I'm indebted to Michigan and to the organizers of this symposium, uh, thanks to whom I'm able to share this experience with you. Uh, thank you very much.